there. It's Gary Parrish. Welcome back. CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, leaky, black, the Eye on College Basketball Podcast, presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel Sportsbook, make every moment more. Matt Norlanda is here with you. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button like your Brandon Davies. You have consent. And don't forget while you're here to also subscribe to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel. If you haven't done that yet, let's get into it. The game of Thursday night originated in uh, Tucson, Arizona, where Washington State found itself in need of uh, nothing more than a a win at Arizona to take sole possession of first place in the Pac-12 standings. Problem is, nobody wins at Arizona. Tommy Lloyd's Wildcats entered the game with a 13-0 record at home this season. They were 13.5-point favorites at tip. This was not supposed to be close, but... Hey, that's why they play the games, dead leg. Final score, Washington State 77, Arizona 74. Cougars after being picked 10th in the preseason Pac-12 poll and having zero conference championships since 1941 are now alone atop the Pac-12 standings with just four regular season games remaining. Dead leg. Makes sense of the miracle Cal Smith is pulling off in Pullman. It's an awesome game. It went... It went late, but your guy stayed up to watch all of it. I think this thing ended at about 1.20 Eastern or thereabouts. Um, I'll go big picture on on Kyle in a second, but I want to talk about the game because it was uh, it was a heck of a game. I thought it was going to be close. I thought Arizona would win, but I did think that Washington State was going to be able to keep it close, um, and it was uh, quite enjoyable here. I think Nada's got the box score. He'll toss it up in just a second. Um Jalen Wells is the big name to know from this one because he was outrageously good and it was his <clears throat> it was his four point play from the corner on an offensive rebound slash busted possession that gave Washington State the lead after Arizona was up four with about a minute to go. Wells was nine of 16 from the field. He made six trays in this game and was just huge uh, game high or 27 points. Caleb Love also had 27. Caleb Love didn't even get a chance to get off the final shot because he wound up slipping and falling while driving to the hoop there. Um, He should not have done that. That was not smart. Well, you know, I don't think that was in the plan. I don't think Tommy Tommy Lloyd drew up the Caleb drive to the hoop and fall on your ass play, but that's how it went down. Washington State. Yeah. Washington State wins 77, 74 um, and gets just a, a huge win in a really tough environment. I just... You know, such an enjoyable game. Well said afterward. I've got it here. I pulled up the quotes uh, early this morning because he was he was something else. He said, this is big. There's a lot of moments we could have folded, but we stayed poised, kept fighting back. I think it's a big win for us just because people thought we were the underdogs. People saying, oh, you got to go play Arizona. No, they've got to play us. And as for I love that. And as for the, um, the winning Put it shot, on a T-shirt. They've got to play us. Yeah. You're stuck in here with me. Yeah. Um, he said on the on the play that he won uh, that he helped win the game. It, didn't, it wasn't technically uh, the winner in the moment, but he said honestly, I caught the ball, I shot it, I didn't see the rim. Then I was laying on the ground. A dude was sitting on me. I look up and hear someone say, "Yeah, dog," and uh, <laughs> it was it was a crazy shot. Like it was it was really 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 impressive. And um, I just I I can't say enough about what Kyle Smith has done. Uh, this was the first time since 1983 that Washington State had defeated a team ranked in the top four of the AP Top 25. 83, 39 years. And now Washington State is atop the Pac-12. Trivia time. I figured you might have looked this up. When was the most recent year Washington State won the regular season in the configuration in a prior iteration that was essentially the back Pac-12, Al, here's your first hint. It was nowhere close to being named or being the Pac-12 at that point. Oh, man, that's going to be like eight, 1888. No, <laughs> James Naismith had not invented basketball yet in 1888. Uh, but he was thinking about it. He was already uh, thinking he about it. Been, he might have been thinking about it. He might have been thinking about it. He was, he was already – I know he was thinking about it. What's your, I, what's know, your I, I know it was in there somewhere. Most recent – Conference championship. Yeah. Yeah. It's not 1888. I'd probably have to go with like 1931. Uh, You're only 10 years away, my man. 1941. The Pacific. Well, hold, up. I mean, hold up a second. Conference. I've already said this 50 times. I thought this was some 
other thing you were trying to come up with. I'm well aware they haven't won a conference championship since 1941. That's what I said. The last time they won a regular season in a conference, it wasn't called the Pac-12 then, it was 1941. Yeah, but you threw some weird words in there that got me confused. I'm sorry for using the English language. I'll try I'll try better next time. Just tone <laughs> it down a little bit, all right? Only two? Dial it back. You're talking to I'm, – I'm a product of Mississippi public schools. Dial it back a little bit. Again, my bad for using our common dialect. Here's the deal. Washington State only has two regular season titles in its history. 1917. I don't even think that should count, if I'm being honest here. Like, that shouldn't even count. I, it's, I'm giving it one. I'm taking that one off the books. I'm sorry, Wazoo. And 1941. And they're and they're got a great chance to do it now. This we we talked about Washington State recently because the Miles Rice thing, and I wrote about that. And it still oh, no. remains. It still I, remains. I, disco- I I discovered no. Washington State. You did not. Rice only had five points, um, but they swept Arizona nonetheless. First time since 2010 that they swept them. So I'm going a little long here. I'm just tossing it right back to you for thoughts on on the game or the story and and the, just. What is emerging here out of Pullman is such an awesome, awesome deal. And uh, for them to get that road win, whoo, boy, Washington State now, I think, won seven in a row. I want the I want the official record to reflect that I'm very aware that Washington State's last conference championship was 1941. I mean, it's in the top 25 and one this morning. And that was <laughs> that was that was filed two hours ago. All right. I, I, I know. Every, yeah, I know okay. at this point, I know everything about Washington State. Okay. I thought I asked it pretty clearly, but it is early in the morning. So you you put a word in there that I didn't quite. I thought you was trying to. Tr- I thought you were saying before 1941. What was I it? I didn't say that. I didn't say before 1941. I know, but you had a word in there, buddy. Just re- go back and replay it. There was it had it had like a bunch of syllables. It got it. It was like it's, 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 situation got you. Yeah. Is a tough. Is a tough. Okay. You put me in a tough spot very early on a Friday. Um, I got one for you. This comes from Jared Burson. He invented ESPN stats and info. At this point, he's like programming like 20% of your material, by the way. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is how I learn stuff. Okay. How else do you learn stuff? Sorry for trying to be smarter. (laughs) Sorry for trying to learn. I know we live in a world where nobody wants to learn anything anymore. I'm trying to learn still. Jared Burson, he runs ESPN stats and info forever. Lifetime contract over there. he, he tells us that uh, Washington State is now the only school in the country that has two wins over the past two seasons on the road against a team ranked in the top five of the AP poll. Boom. You ready for this? Before Kyle Smith did it? 1941. Never. Never. 0-34 all time. The program was 0-34 all time on the road against the top five opponent. Kyle, Kyle Smith moves to Washington State. He's 2-0. and Kelvin Sampson, zero. Tony Bennett, zero. Kyle Smith, 2-0. and I think I know what that means. Naismith Memorial Hall of Famer Kyle Smith. Well, I thought you were about to say Kyle Smith is your national coach of the year. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're there already. <laughs> oh, I, I saw the tweets last night. Man, nothing gets – nobody – I bet you in the in, – in, in one college basketball season, like 17 different dudes get called the National Coach of the Year at some point. Hey, let us get caught up in the moment. It was a, it was a fun late night uh, for College Hoops Twitter, and I think he is uh, arguably the front runner. That is our poll chat right now. We'll give you the results here before we get out of the A Black. Any more thoughts on uh, on yeah, what's emanating in Pullman, man? Obviously, one of the best stories of the year. It, well, you know, I was flying home last night. Thankfully, thankfully, the game started late enough. I got home at halftime, so I was able to watch the oh, whole second half. Wow. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, late, I late arrival for your guy over there. Yeah, it's a tough living a tough life. <laughs> you don't even want to know. You don't know. You don't want to know what the, what you don't want to know what my life's dealing with right now. <laughs> so I get home and I've got uh, I was able to watch the second half. And what was most interesting is like it it played out in a way that it just felt like, all right, if this were a 37 minute game, they'd have mm-hmm. won it. If this were a 38 minute game, they'd have won it, but they're not gonna win 40. I mean, it felt like it slipped away from them, right? Yes, for sure. I thought Alabama. I thought Alabama. I thought Arizona was going to win that one uh, down the stretch there because they they took a lead and Washington State. Like you're on the road and and McKay looked rocking. They had some like like fish show glow stick situation going on that I really like. I hope that's not just a one game thing. If they'd been doing it earlier this season, I'm sorry, just I missed on that. So no, yeah, the vibes were very good for Arizona. They were relying on Caleb Love to the extent where I, I think they probably should and need to, but it it definitely was. 
you know, the Caleb Love experience trademark. You know, it's just, and unfortunately, like probably most people thought, I thought they were actually going to have Pella Larson maybe try and get that last shot off. And heck, for all I know, maybe that was an option on that play. And it, it just got unlucky when he slipped and fell and they didn't even get the chance to get the puck. Yeah, listen, I'm not going to blame Caleb Love for slipping. No, all right. Slipping. You know, he he got, he. I mean, he he was getting where he was trying to get to. And he just slipped. And he it's not like he hadn't made a big play just a minute earlier. Hit a, right? hit a layup with 51 seconds to go that uh, that helped, you know, give Arizona a little bit. of That's a right. And then that was followed by the Jalen Wells uh, four point play. So, uh, you know, yes, it was the Caleb Love experience. And I guess that's a, a, a part of the story that he slipped with the game on the line. But he slipped with the game on the line. He didn't take an awful shot with the game on the line. He just slipped. And sometimes that happens in basketball. But my my larger point, I was just impressed. Washington State first, they came out and they're they're in it from the jump. They're in it the whole game. They're controlling most of the game. And then I've seen it a million times. The perceived better team is at home, and they just flip it in the final six minutes. It just, it happens. You see, you know where you really see it NBA all the time when you got these really good teams on the second night of back-to-backs and they're like going through the motions and it's like, all right, let's go win this now. And then they'll play the fourth quarter and they'll get out of there with the win. I see this stuff all the time. And it felt like that's what Arizona was going to do. All right, we've been, we've, we've let them hang around, but now let's go take this. And Washington State took it right back. That's like, that's how you win a conference championship for the first time since 1941. It, it's impressive stuff. And, you know, it, this thing can still go a million different ways. But Kim Palm does, for what it's worth, project Arizona and Washington State to now both finish 15 and 5 in the Pac 12. And that would make them co champs if it goes down that way. And that would be good enough to, to be a conference champion for the first time in more than eight decades. Yeah, right now, here's the fight. And I'm a stickler when it comes to lock. So I, I, I'm almost at lock status with Washington State. If it were to lose its final four regular season games in its first Pac 12 tournament game, it actually might be sticky, but the, it's going to the tournament, people. It literally needs one more win, and it will be a lock. They play Arizona State on Saturday. ASU almost came back, which I wonder if it was going to be the biggest comeback in school history against Washington, um, but it, they didn't. So we'll see if uh, Arizona State can pick itself up off the mat and uh, try and give Wazoo a game on Saturday. But yeah, at this point, Wazoo has won all but one game since January 6th. The loss was in overtime against Cal at 12 and four. And then here's the deal. It's at a ASU, but GP, then it's home USC, home right. UCLA, home Washington. Uh, high probably. I know uh, Pomeroy's got, uh, got Arizona and Washington state winding up tied with at 15 and five in the league. Um, yeah. I guess that's the worst case scenario. Cause I mean, you know, barring what we just, what we haven't seen to be the case at all this season, uh, Washington state's going to have a claim to a conference crown and, a couple more thoughts on this whole thing. I think it is so incredible that after this school and uh, and Oregon State, but Oregon State isn't holding up its end of the uh, storybook uh, uh, portion of this whole thing. Washington State just left stranded. You know, even you know Stanford and Cal bolting for you know the odd bedfellow situation with the ACC and then everyone that goes to the the Big 12. Last night was a WCC Big 12 matchup oh by the way and this final year of the Pac 12 with Arizona going to the Big 12 next season and I I I think it's just really really cool that this program in the final year of the Pac 12 as we know it is uh is on pace to win it. And I know its president has uh up until a few days ago was creating a, a little bit of a filibuster situation with the CFP. Why not, man? You got left in the cold, and uh, they won out some lawsuits. So Washington State has been taking wins left and right. I think that's, uh, personally, uh, I hate the fact that the Pac-12 dissolved. And so, yeah, any uh, any flowers and, and victories and awesomeness and great headlines that come Washington State's way, I'm more than okay with it. I think it's a really cool plot uh, development uh, in college sports. And also... Also, I woke up to this this morning. I, the game ended. I was wiped. I was like, all right, time for bed. D this is uh, incredible. Um, I looked and I didn't see any video. So I don't know if video is out there. Uh, this is from Matt Chazanow, who tweeted this at 128 Eastern. Uh, he is the play-by-play -play voice of the Washington State football and men's basketball program. Washington State assistant coach Jeremy Harden, Tucson native, just proposed at midcourt after the win here in Tucson. She said, yes, Cougs win. Harden gets engaged. He went to Tucson High 
beats Arizona, gets engaged on the midcourt A logo. So, I mean, talk about your all-time night, man. My brother shouts to Cody, who listens to this pod, and his uh, fiance Kayla. They just recently got engaged like last week. I told him I'd get a mention on the show. This is your this is your chance, little bro. So congrats to them. But this is nothing on the Washington State assistant going <laughs> back home, getting what I what I would love to know is if you lost the game, what's the plan? Like you're still doing this? They pull off the upset, an all timer. Maybe he maybe he pivoted in the moment. Is like you know what I, I'm doing it now. This is my hometown. Really, really, really cool story. Congrats to. Jeremy Harden and his now fiance for pulling off just something amazing. The fact that he's from Tucson and they sweep GP, they sweep Arizona. He does it in the perfect, perfect situation. Program almost never is in that spot. So I wanted to bring that up. Congrats to him. Really cool vibes right now with that whole program. Congrats, Cody, on your engagement. Your brother thinks it's awesome, but just not as awesome as Jeremy Harden's. Correct. Uh, my right. brother did it on Valentine's Day, which more power to him. Uh, his fiance didn't think it was coming. He surprised her totally, which is awesome. Thrilled. Uh, he didn't participate in a rare season sweep of a of a top 10 level kind of program Slack. and then have the opportunity to propose on the hard one. So he comes in second place here. That's right. It, it, you know what? When you when you lay it out like that, I don't know how I could I don't know how I could argue. I know you're wondering, so I'll tell you. Washington State number 11, number 11, Ooh. number 11. Okay, that's a little aggressive because that's not a 3 seed resume, is it? I'm telling you. Is it? I'm telling you it's closer than you think. Ooh. It, the predictive metrics aren't there yet, but in terms of quad one wins and record inside the first two quadrants and any sort of damage outside of the first two quadrants, at least the way I interpret this stuff, it's 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 right up there. There, how about this? I know they're not a lock for the NCAA tournament yet, but they're a lot closer to being a three seed in the NCAA tournament than they are to being on the bubble. Some may call them a lock. I'm a bit litigious. One more win, Wazoo, and then you are officially a lock and lose every game and have zero fear of missing the tournament. It's good, good stuff. Uh, not a Real quick, turn on the mic. What's the uh, what's the National Coach of the Year results as we get ready for this B block here? The options were Dan Hurley, Kyle Smith, Danny Sprinkler, or other. And I know we had some names in the chat. What is it? Uh, what's the breakdown here on this Friday morning? Kyle Smith is winning this thirty two percent. Dan Hurley at thirty percent. Other who and none were really listed. I saw a couple of Matt Painter references at twenty two percent, and Danny Sprinkle not getting nearly enough respect at fifteen percent. Okay, still a good little race there. I, 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 think, I think right now you could make easy cases for any of them. Matt Painter, because his team is number one in the country, as far as I'm concerned. Dan Hurley, because he lost three of his top six, and is his team is actually ranked number one in the AP poll right now. Yeah. Um, Kelvin Sampson, like, don't forget about this. Uh, he, he took an AAC program to the best league in the country and is about to win it. <laughs> And is ranked number one in most of the computers. Yeah. I mean, that's easy. Uh, Danny Sprinkle, obviously, at Utah State, we've talked about. But absolutely, Kyle Smith. I mean, you take a program that's never supposed to win, and you're on the verge of winning a conference championship, and you you, you sweep Arizona, which was announced as a one seed just you know the mm -hmm. other day by the selection committee. Regular season sweep of them. You win as a 13 half point under, like all of it. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't think there's a dumb answer as long as your answer is. You know, and, and there's probably more, but certainly those five guys um, are, are are totally worthy candidates right now. Speaking of Dan Hurley, uh, he dropped something a couple days ago on social media. GP, I feel like we have to talk about this. So if uh, if you're good with that, I am and not a, you know, what we got to do it's partners time. Pot Wake up to football highlights and news from around the world with the one and only Morning Footy Team. Rise and shine, football fans. Welcome to Morning Footy. Start your all-day football craze with Morning Footy, part of the all-new Galazzo Network. So UConn's Dan Hurley had a viral treat in advance of Saturday's game with Villanova. It came less than 24 hours after he apparently... Apparently, told a Creighton fan he'd knock him out. No, no, no. I have the I have the update on that. Did you not see the other view? Uh, uh. Okay, real quick on this. Uh, not. I should have sent it to you. That's okay. So there was another video that came out that is much closer to Hurley, and uh, you can hear more of Hurley. You still can't hear what the Creighton fan is saying. At least I couldn't pick up on it. And to me, it seems much more logical and likely. And if you hate UConn and Hurley, I get this. But I listened to this thing like eight times. Okay. It really, really seems like. What Hurley is saying, there's someone Creighton fan is doing something, and then he gets Hurley's attention, and and Hurley's walking next to uh, someone that's escorting him out with security, and it almost says like, 
if you jump over, if you jump over, he'll knock you out. So he's saying, don't uh, try to do something stupid. He will <laughs> like, he's advised to put his hands on you if you come after me. So I think that's what it was. If you hate Hurley, you think he's telling someone he's going to knock him out. But, and trust me, I think Dan Hurley is entirely capable. It is within his mental capacity to say, I'll knock you out. He's from <laughs> Jersey. But I do think in this situation, he was actually saying, don't even think about it, man. He will come after you. Continue. And the he, of course, was Luke Murray. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Of course. <laughs> what if Luke would have knocked out a Creighton fan in defense of Dan Hurley? Oh, gosh. Oh, my goodness. That's a good one. Anyway, continue. I, I cut you off there, but I wanted to at least bring a little more clarity. No, I, 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 had, I had not. I you caught fans on your ass even more, okay? Yeah, no, I had not. I had genuinely, yeah. keep in mind, yeah. I uh, was traveling yesterday. Yeah. I had genuinely not seen the updated version. Either way, I just laughed at it. Whatever the version is, I just I agree. laugh. I, I just laugh at it. Whatever version's true, like you pick, and I'm going to laugh. This, you pick which version you want to believe, and then tell it to me, and I'll, I'll laugh either way. So... Um, with all of this happening, whatever the context, Dana decides to jump on Twitter again, less than 24 hours after losing at Creighton. And, and here's the, the tweet. Shame. Shouts to Game of Thrones. Shouts to Game of Thrones. Trivia time. What season is that from? Oh, man. Uh, 1941. <laughs> I think it's season four. I'm not good at remembering stuff about television shows that I watch. Are you the type that I, you, you could somebody could say, do you remember episode seven, season four, Game of Thrones? And you'd be like, oh, yeah, sure. Not like that, but generally speaking, I'm pretty decent. It's it's season five. I thought it was uh, it's the finale of season five, I think. So I will yeah. watch an entire show. Like I'll watch The Sopranos, and I'll know the big storylines. But if you're like, remember that episode? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Well, that's well, binging will do that for you. By the way, you binge, you binge, you watch so much, you forget things. Anyway, Dan Hurley taking to the tweet machine and doing this. The only thing I wish is there had been. Uh, different photoshopped sad Dan Hurley faces as as the camera <laughs> changed, but and uh, simply with the caption "See you Saturday." Shame being not not him warning about getting someone getting knocked out. That's not the, just so we're clear. That is not what he's shamed. It's shame over getting beat by nineteen on the road against Creighton. And uh, we're not going to put UConn Nova in the final four and one, so we can talk about this game here now and how much we love this in general. It, Villanova. Do, are we are we going rare zero chance at a win here? Because <laughs> I mean, oh no, I'm not playing that game. But okay, okay. But I tell you, um, I bet you the betting markets to move this number by like a point and a half because everybody <laughs> they're, they're not a casual in the world who ain't ready to lay anything, any number with Dan Hurley this weekend. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I, I, and the thing is like, I just, I want more of this, this, you know, part of why I love college hoops right here, man. I want more of this just coaches. And I don't care if it's their social media managers. I don't care how it gets out there. Just being more willing to uh, admit when you're wrong, admit when your team has a bad game and, and lean into it, just lean into it. This was, this was great stuff from, uh, from Hurley. I absolutely loved it. He's uh he's listening from us. as he likes to say it, the squirrels, the squirrels might've gotten to him a little bit, but this was, <laughs> This was fantastic. Well, like, did this? Are are there squirrels out there? Like, are people out there questioning Dan Hurley? He seems like he's almost above it at this point. His, his, I've actually talked with him about this. Um, <laughs> I actually randomly will just text him squirrels. I, don't know. <laughs> I swear to God, I will. Um, and to him, it's more like it's the small talk chatter from the people that that you don't uh, let affect your like your day to day and all that kind of stuff. So the people that were overhyping UConn is number one. They're squirrels. The people saying that UConn sucks now because they lost to Creighton. There's frankly, there's very few people, but those people would also be squirrels. I've got a squirrel soundbite from Dan Hurley. I've got to update and upload on the board here, but uh, but that should be coming soon. So, so yes. And now you got Nova coming in, um, eight o'clock Eastern Fox game, and Nova. Uh, it's a super weird resume. Um, got to go into Gamble. This is just a tall task, huge ask. Um, you know, think about last week, GP in Hartford, different building, not as even as intimidating environment, frankly, as Gamble, obviously, as any UConn fan knows. And they mutilate Marquette. Uh, I, 
I don't know. I actually genuinely don't know what the Ken Palm line is here. I'm going to get, I'll guess. I have not looked. I'll guess it's UConn by 13. Do you have it in front of you? UConn minus 10. Ooh. That's too little, right? Too little. <laughs> little. It might be too little. And hey, listen, it'd be fascinating to me. I, a close game would be all the more riveting. Give it to me. I'll take it. I'll take it every single time. But, um, but I don't know, like to be a fly on the wall in UConn's practices the past couple of days. Cause I do think, and I think you'd agree with this. Um, I said this on HQ earlier in the week, or maybe I guess it was the night they won the game. Maybe he was on this pod too. I think on some level, like Hurley does not want to lose. Don't get me wrong. But there's a part of him that's like, all right, good. Uh, punch me while I'm down. Make me bleed. I want to taste the blood. Now I'm pissed off. And now we're going to burn off this fuel for the next like five weeks. So um, I think that's uh, I think that's a way that he'll use this to his advantage. And you'll see that, you know, materialize on the floor Saturday night. I mean, it's basketball. You never know. But I'll be, I'd be surprised if they don't respond i'd be surprised if they don't show up it, it feels like you know one of those 11 to 2 starts type of things that they do to people sometimes i i, I won't be shocked if we see something like that but villanova is playing better um back in the top 35 of the net back in the top 35 at ken palm um the problem they just did so much stupid damage <laughs> into their resume like in philadelphia uh -huh. Like, if Villanova's not in the NCAA tournament, it's Philadelphia's fault. The Big Five, man. Killed them. Pitt, St. Joe's, Drexel. Those three quad or three losses. Hold on. Pitt. You said Pitt. That's on the other side of the state. Pin. Pitt. <laughs> Pin. 1941. Pin. Pitt will take the win, but it does not have it over Villanova this season. Sure use it. Pick. Sure use it. Yeah. Pin. St. Joe's, Drexel. Those are three quad or three losses on Villanova's resume. Um, that's why they're on the wrong side of the bubble right now. But a win at UConn could obviously uh, maybe change that or at least move them in the right direction. But nine and eight with in the first two quadrants with uh, three quadrant one wins and three quadrant three losses, that's not that's not good enough right now. They've got they got work to do. We got to get to a final four and one, do we not? Oh, I don't know if you want to because I've been killing. Well, uh, let's let you know what. Partners, and we got we got to sort a couple things out here, but I think it's partners time. I think it is. Come on, one more. Come on, let's go. One partners. We need the sports news anywhere. We've got breaking news to bring you. Then get your sports anytime you want them. Big trade news overnight to discuss. Because we know you need sports all the time. A lot of movement in the rankings this week. A legend adds to their legacy. We're bringing you that breaking news right here on HQ. CBS Sports HQ, anywhere, anytime, all the time. It's the final four and one presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. Do you want to know the updated records? I got them right in front here's, of me. Here's the deal for the audience. So last Friday, I was not on the show because I was traveling. So Parrish did it with Boone. Oh, and I, so, um, I asked Boone on Saturday morning. I said, send me the games that were picked and I will pick them. And I sent them to Boone actually like 30 minutes before I sent them to you. And then I was like, you know what? That's not good enough. I got to send these things to Paris. So I sent them to you. What I don't have, oh, I guess I could dive back into Boone's text message as well. I picked Virginia to cover last week and it won by two against Wake. I don't think that's a cover. I picked UConn to cover. Oh, yes, it covered. I picked Kentucky to cover. It covered. That's two and one. I picked Purdue. I honestly don't know if Purdue covered last weekend or not. And then I picked AM, which it did not. So I think I was three and two GP. Um, but for the listeners that didn't get my picks, I did get them in, in time, so our tally is even. So uh, if that is accurate, I went three and two. What did you do? You went three and two. I went two and three. But I still have what most would consider, most Some. historians would consider an insurmountable lead. Huh? I'm now 42, 32, and three. That's 10 games above 500. Dead like you're 39, 35, and three. So I've got a three-game lead. Okay. As March approaches, I can see it just right around the corner. March is approaching, and I have I have what historians would consider an insurmountable lead in the final four. Do you see one. a lot of things coming around the corner? Is that is that the thing? I don't see a lot. Let's, I don't, let's, I don't let's, look around the corner so much. <laughs> I try to stay away from corners. Okay. All right. At, at, this, at this stage of my life. Oh, I hear that music. Let's oh, go. Here oh, we go. Come on oh, now. When you hear that music, you know what time it is. <laughs> Oh, you know what time it is when you hear that music. Let's go. What's game one? Game one, Saturday, noon Eastern. It's number two, Houston at number 11, Baylor inside Huck Pavilion. You can watch it on CBS. That's America's most watched network. It's the network of stars. 
Kim Pop's got a Houston minus three. <sighs> we got a great Saturday on CBS coming, folks. If you're not already familiar, you're familiar now. I will be in studio, by the way, in the afternoon and deep into the evening. CBS Sports HQ. Keep that going on your phone. So Second will I. I'll be in studio, too. What? But we'll be in different studios, I guess. I'm going to Florida here in a minute. What? I'm going to Florida in a minute. So you're going to the Fort Lauderdale studios for HQ? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. So here's the deal. Like, 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 like soon. You don't have your Memphis show? No, I got to do that. Then we're going straight to the airport. I'm going okay. to talk, talk for like four hours and then go straight to the airport and not say right, a so word. Here's the, the deal. Of the here's the deal. Watch CBS Sports HQ for the best highlights, analysis, insider information, everything. Parrish will be on in the morning and afternoon in Fort Lauderdale. And then I will be on. We have two studios, folks. Actually, we have three. There's also one in, in England for all the Galazzo stuff. I will be on from Connecticut. Go to <laughs> Who's gonna, are they sending David Cobb to that one? <laughs> Okay, for the overnight shift. All right, all right. We got to keep it on track here. Parrish will be in studio from Fort Lauderdale on uh, tomorrow for the morning for the morning and afternoon. And then I'm on from like 4 p.m. into the night. And David Cobb's going to handle the overnight. Yes. Shout out to Noah, like Rick London. Kilborn back in the day, 1996 overnight sports center. Real ones know. Okay, here we go. Houston Baylor, first of uh, of a great Saturday on CBS, obviously. Um, the off, off awesome offense for Baylor. Awesome defense for Houston here. And Baylor, you know, I think this building is going to be incredible. They're going to be ready. Houston um, has won four straight and nine of ten overall and has been playing as well as any team in the country right now. If it wins at Baylor, um, I think you're going to see him number one in the polls on Monday there. And this is also, by the way, LJ Cryer uh, going back to play his former team. He now plays for Houston, obviously, previously at Baylor. Um, Baylor has won six straight home games versus top 25 teams. It's 4-0 and against ranked competition this year in its own building. I think Eves Misi is the key in this game, GP. Uh, he's averaged 15 points and shot 72% from the floor the past five games. Keep an eye on him. Parrish, I'm going to take Baylor in this game. I will, uh, I'll I'll take him to win. I'll take him to cover. Scott Drew shouts to Huck. He gets a big-time victory. Yeah, Houston uh, has that one-game lead over Iowa State in the standings. They're ranked number one in adjusted defensive efficiency, number one in defensive block percentage, number two in steal percentage, number two in effective field goal percentage, number two in field goal per- uh, two-point field goal percentage. Like, they're just excellent at everything. They'll block your shots. They'll take your balls. They're excellent at everything. What? Here's my here's my favorite. They're number one in the country in what amounts to defensive free throw percentage, which means you can't even score really on them. Luck based. Yes, yes. When they're when they're not even allowed to guard you, you can't score on them. That's how good they are. That's crazy. Yes. It's wild. It's like you don't even think you deserve to put a point out against them, so you miss. It's it's quite a thing Kelvin Sampson has developed down there. I'm with you though. We've seen what going on the road and trying to win looks like. It's difficult. It's difficult in this country. And I think Houston will find it difficult inside Huck Pavilion on Saturday. I also will take the home underdog. Give me Baylor plus three. Game two, Saturday, 2 p.m. Eastern. It's number eight, Duke at Wake Forest inside Anthony Billis Veterans Memorial Coliseum. You can watch it on ESPN. Kim Palmer has it Duke minus one. Dude, awesome game. Special shout to Anthony Billis. It's a That's researcher, right. CBS Sports. That's a great job. Don't great know if you job. listen to the pod, but Anthony, we appreciate your work. And, uh, and great job, an impressive young man. Those Billises, they sure did raise an impressive young man. Yeah, this is his alma mater, of course. And a huge game here. You see uh, you see Forbes call out Lunardi a couple days ago? <laughs> Forbes, Forbes, Forbes is like poster boy for he hates all the computer numbers <laughs> he well, they hates- like him i think he doesn't like the bracketologists i think that's uh, and if you don't have wake if you don't have wake in the field he's coming for your ass before the end of the day paris oh, oh buddy if you if you if you want to if you want to if you want to spend 30 minutes text fours and be like say hey, what do you think of the net <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna do it right now i'm gonna do it right now <laughs> Hey, you got. Right you, hey, hey, you got. I know you got a big game tomorrow, but if you got ten minutes, I was. I wanted to get your thoughts on the net. You think <laughs> I won't do this out of nowhere? You, you're wrong. Uh, 
<laughs> Here we go. Uh, I'm sending it. Talk about the game while I send this text real quick. Okay, so uh, as of last night, Wake had moved to 27th of the net, 21st at Ken Palm. So moving in the right direction, but still not in the field, according to Jerry Palm. Um, and <laughs> hey, hey, take it up with Palm. It ain't got nothing to do with me. Wake, Wake is five and nine in the first two quadrants. They only got that one quadrant, one win. They've got four quadrant, two losses. Here's how. This is always because I think sometimes people get confused, but it, 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 I'll just say. Um, so you might go, okay, Wake is five and nine in the first two quadrants, four games below 500 in the first two quadrants, but 27th in the net, 21st at Kimba. How do they? How do you have these strong computer numbers when they got that kind of record against quality opponents? And uh, the simplest answer appears to be they played a lot of close games that they've lost. Eight of their nine losses are by single digits. No, almost nobody just beats them bad. They're they're in everything. One of their losses is in overtime. Mm -hmm. And of the eight losses that are in regulation, five of them are by five or fewer points. So a lot of close games. That's a good way to get computer numbers to be better than your resume. That appears to be Wake Forest's story this season. Um, big opportunity. I mean, is this I'm not, Wake, I'm not a Wake Forest historian, but would you call this the biggest game of the Steve Forbes era at Wake? It might be. There's been a couple of games where they were, you know, really close to the tournament, and I, I think those technically were bigger. But home game situation, like because those other ones were in the ACC tournament, definitely possible. I want to see um, the screaming deacons, uh, the screaming demons, and the freaking deacons show up big time. I need tie dye nation going nuts in the Joel on Saturday. Huge game. Big opportunity for Wake Forest and the ACC. Uh, Wake Forest, yes, a, a metrics darling in terms of 20th at Ken Palm. Hunter Salas has been tremendous this year, transferred. Forbes has been a little bit of a miracle worker with transfers at a rate better than most other coaches in the past three or four years. He's gotten guys like Alondis Williams to be ACC Player of the Year and just sent him Jake LaRavia. These guys were not like super highly covered in the portal, and then they go in there making the NBA, man. So Forbes and his staff have done a wonderful job. Keep an eye on Hunter Salas in this game. Andrew Carr has also been really good. Tyrese Proctor probably not going to play unless Duke's got uh, a surprise for us. He's in concussion protocol, he hasn't been practicing, so Duke will be shorthanded. Um, I do the Naismith uh, watch update for CBS Sports, and I still I put Kyle Filipowski in the top ten overall. It's going to be Edie's award to win, but I got to do ten candidates, and I think I had flipped like eight this week. Um, he's earned it. He's been good. It can't be just him, but this is a. Uh, it's really like it's it's not a Saturday overloaded with games uh, like you know. 13 like really really compelling games but we've got to, again we've got, just like last week and the week before we have a nice stagger to these there's almost like a in each tv window there's a good centerpiece game to focus your attention on duke at wake is that game um i think this is going to be an awesome watch i expect it kind of similar to arizona and washington state like neither team led by more than seven i almost think we're going to get that kind of game here gp uh in winston-salem i will take what you said the line was um, we've got it as Duke minus one, another home underdog. I will. Mm, yeah. Top 10 team. Oh, is this a top 10 team on the road against an unranked opponent right now? Because, uh, because of that, you know what? F it. Because of that, give me, give me Wake Forest to win this game. Yeah. Give me Wake Forest. I'm actually surprised with them ranked that high that Duke's actually favored by one at Ken Palm. I wonder when this actual line on FanDuel comes out. If Duke will be favored or not, I almost feel like this might be Wake minus one, but it is Duke, and sometimes those lines can be influenced a little bit by public uh, opinion, perception, and and what the what the masses may bet on. So Duke might well be uh, favored in this one. Give me Wake straight up. I'll take them to win. I will also take Wake straight up to win the game. Give me that point. Game three, Saturday, four Eastern, number thirteen, Alabama at number seventeen, Kentucky, inside Aaron Harrison Arena. Okay, people are saying Proctor played against uh, Miami. The game was a blowout. I didn't even realize that. So Proctor's going to play in the game. Want to at least uh, correct that. So thank you for the chat for him. For Nigel Pack up. did not play for Miami Nigel in that Pack game. And Miami was was way down. Yes. Okay. Inside Aaron Harrison Arena, you can watch it on CBS, America's most watched network, Ooh. network of stars. Kim Palm's got this one. Alabama minus two on the road. Woo! Home underdog. Calipari. What, what's the post game for Calipari going to be in this one? If that's become like a thing, by the way, now. Like every game, win or lose, there's some story. Like he's he's not done media or didn't do the post game radio show, and then last week he had the little display. This past he had answered three questions after they lost. We can use this real buddy, quick to talk about the loss against LSU. By the way, uh, buddy, uh, buddy beat Auburn. Yeah, 
beat Auburn and said, hey, just keep taking shots at me. Leave my kids alone. Then he lost to LSU, and he's like, I got to go watch this film, see which one of these kids couldn't grab a ball. <laughs> he said he had to leave early because they had an early, they had a, a quick turnaround. The game oh, it's always, it's always something. 29 it, hours. It's always something. Um, so let me run you through some numbers real quick and then get your thoughts. Okay. We talked about this. Awesome win at Auburn. That was two straight um, incredible defensive performances, Ole Miss and Auburn. And UK had held those two teams last week to 0.79 points per possession in those two victories. Before those games, UK's defense was ranked 135th nationally through 23 contests. And they were giving up 102.6 points per 100 possessions. That was according to Torvik. But the performance against Ole Miss and Auburn, that jumped Kentucky into the top 95 nationally in adjusted defensive efficiency. 40-spot jump in a span of five days. We talked about it. And then we asked the question, did they find something? Is it fixed? Or is it just like, that's one week, and there's been a whole bunch of other weeks, and they looked a lot different in most of the other weeks, and I'll be surprised if they don't start looking that way more than they consistently look this way. Again, we still don't have a clear answer to that question. This could have just been one bad outing. But against LSU, they did allow 1.06 points per possession. Um, and if you were to take that number and then put it in the season rankings and say, where would that rank nationally? 167th in the country, according to Torvik. So they reverted in this one. And oh, by the way, when they needed a stop in the final seconds well, to win, they couldn't get it. It was a weird play, but they, need, they needed a stop and they didn't get a stop. Well, on that, and real quick, let's just at least address that game. It was Wednesday night. Uh, Rob Dillingham had a couple of outrageous baskets to put Kentucky in position to win the game. Then Dillingham, you know, Tyrell Ward hits the winner. Dillingham isn't near him. It's his man technically, I guess. I don't want to say with 100% certainty. Maybe they had a different setup there. All I know is this. It was a broken play. Dillingham wasn't in the picture there. But Adutiero, like, had a great defensive play, man. It was a freak play. LSU wins because Tyrell Ward's in the right spot after Jordan Wright gets the ball swatted right back into his hands. He's falling out of bounds and just desperation. Ah, you take it. Hot potato. Tyrell Ward's right there. They beat the buzzer. Congrats to Matt McMahon. That's the kind of win that you're aching for when you're trying to build up a program in a really tough league. So um, I know he and that fan base really appreciate just getting any kind of win. Uh, but, you know, till that moment, Kentucky actually did a decent enough decent enough uh, job on defense in, in a single possession kind of situation there. But, yes, to your general point, GP, I would agree Dillingham is something else, man. Uh, the, the discourse around him continues, obviously. Um, if you if you watch, watch Dillingham in this game. If you want to focus in on him, just notice the disparity of what he does on offense versus what he does on defense. Maybe he shows up and has the best defensive game of his life on Saturday, but it is a fascinating thing, and I do understand in spurts where Cal and that coaching staff might be like, he's not a 100% shooter, but it's a near 100% certainty that he's gonna his man's going <laughs> to going to break free on the defensive end. Fascinating player. Um, keep an eye on this. Nate Oates has given Kentucky two of its five largest losses by margin ever since Kentucky has had Cal at coach. In January of last year, 26-point loss. And in January of 21, Bama beat Kentucky by 20. Both of these teams are, uh, you know, wired to get to 85-plus. This could be a race to 90, frankly. I hope it is. Uh, really, really good opportunity for this to be a great game, but because of the way both teams play, Parrish, we could have uh, maybe a blowout situation. I don't see a blowout. You know, blowout to me is 15 plus points, the, but it could be double digit margin here. And these are two of the top three scoring offenses in the in, in entire country. So, um, Bama trying to reinforce its credentials to be on that two seed, obviously three seed level. Kentucky just trying to, uh, you know, pick up a little bit of the pieces and, and keep on its winning ways there. I'm going to take Kentucky at home in this spot. Um, I think they get it done. I think you get uh, a really good, another good game from Antonio Reeves. I think Reeves is just in a groove, GP, and I expect him to play well. I, I very much do. I don't think Bama will give a ton of resistance. Bama can win the game, but here... At Rupp, seeing Kentucky last weekend, they showed up big in a big spot there. Um, I'll take UK to win. I'll even toss out a score for you here. I'll go uh, Kentucky wins this one. I'll say 93 to 89 UK wins. Nate Oates is now 3-3 three and three against John Calipari since getting to Alabama. The previous two Alabama coaches combined to go 3-15 and 15 against John Calipari. Nate Oates 3-3. Three and three. He's been terrific. 
I'm going to take Alabama on the road. Um, obviously, Kentucky has shown themselves capable of losing at home. And Alabama is obviously best offensive team in the country. Um, they can hurt you in, you know, in, in like real quickly. Um, I'll take the Crimson Tide to go into Rupp Arena and uh, maintain a okay. lead in the SEC standings. Game four, Sunday noon Eastern. Number 15, Creighton at St. John's inside, laterally slow garden. <laughs> laterally slow garden. Hey, listen, they almost blew it edge against Georgetown. <laughs> they just don't move their feet well, and they're physically weak. You can watch it on CBS, America's most watched networks, the network of stars. Kim Pop's got it, Creighton minus three. At laterally slow garden, another home underdog. Is, is the final four one nothing but home underdogs? Everyone you've given us so far is a home dog? Four home underdogs. Next one is not a home underdog, so so we will not sweep the board there. Again, this is a Sunday game, noon Eastern, CBS. Um, I think David Cobb's going to be giving you the uh, analysis from uh, from the other side of the pond there on that. Right. Um, Creighton beat St. John's back in January. It was like six weeks ago. That was only a one-point win. Um, keep an eye on Baylor Shireman in this one again. Uh, to me, he's been like a second-team All-American level kind of player. And Creighton has owned St. John's, my man. It's won like eight in a row. And all but two of those games have been by double digits. But there's been a few margins by 20-plus points. Um, be interested. Pete Patino is now. Patino had the comments on Sunday that went viral. There was all this reaction. He did follow-up interviews with beat writers and said, I didn't, I'm didn't. i not apologizing. I meant what I said. And here's why I said it and uh, my reasons. And then at his post-game press conference after they beat Georgetown, uh, he de- then he walks some of it back. So this has become, I mean, again, it's Patino. It's become this like story with legs for five days. Um, we'll see what he says or doesn't say if Creighton winds up walking in and uh, and getting a win here. I, it's it's hard for me to take St. John's in the spot. I can see, I can see the Red Storm winning this parish. I can see them pulling this win out uh, after Creighton had you know just. You know, almost like the continuation, the the dominoes of like UConn destroying Marquette. UConn gets wiped, and Creighton destroys UConn. Does Creighton go on the road and have a letdown game against the Johnnies? I think Creighton fans are probably have that at the front of their mind here. But I will go with, I will go with the Blue Jays and Greg McDermott's team. I, they're obviously a much better team than St. John's, and I will trust them to win. And yeah, I'll take them. Uh, I'll take them to cover that number. I'm going with the laterally, laterally slow red storm. Let's see how that works out for you. I'm going to go with the laterally slow red storm. Inside laterally slow guard. No, Rick Rick said he, uh, he finally talked to his assistants, and he was like, uh, uh, how the guys how the guys doing? And they were like, well, you, you know, there's some hurt feelings in there. <laughs> so he was like, okay, I got I to gotta apologize. Listen. All of us, when we're frustrated, maybe not all of us, I don't want to speak for all of us, but lots of us, certainly me, um, you, get in, you, get in, you get frustrated, you get disappointed, you get upset, you say things that you don't mean. Um, most of us, when we say things we don't mean, we don't say them into a microphone on national television, right? Um, and so he, he said what he said. It took him a few days, but he ultimately apologized. It, you know, they're coming off of a win. It should be a nice scene this weekend. I'll take St. John's at home. And uh, if they are to pull off this upset, it'd be a, that's a hell of a week for Rick Patino. <laughs> it really would be. And it would get St. John's back into the bubble conversation. They're not there right now. They're just not. But the win here, uh, that would quad one win, that would go a long way. Here's your quick uh, tour around elsewhere on the dial before we pick the and one game. Um, reminder that St. John's Creighton game is a, uh, is a Sunday situation Friday, Yale at Cornell. Hey, listen, good Ivy league game rematch of an awesome game. They played a couple weeks ago. That's the only Friday game of note there. Seven Eastern Saturday, BYU at K state 2 PM Eastern ESPN plus K state has to win the game. They don't have an at large case right now. Uh, they got to win the game to get on the board. South Carolina plays at Mississippi three Eastern sec network. Another situation where Chris Beard's team now has a home game against South Carolina and the rebels, Right on that cut line right now, so that's uh, that's an urgent game for them. South Carolina just trying to get back into uh, into the good graces of the SEC championship race. Uh, Carolina, Virginia, four Eastern, ESPN, uh, the best game that's not in the final four and one. Uh, Virginia, which has been, you know, 
They've been asked lately, okay? Their T-ball score is unfortunately rising. You don't want a high T-ball score. You want your score in T-ball to be as low as possible, but they've been asked lately, and they've got Carolina coming in there. Uh, big opportunity for the Wahoos, who are in the field. A loss here, and I, they're going to still be in the field, but they will unquestionably be a double-digit seed, and depending on the movement around them. Uh, keep an eye there. That's, uh, that's a really intriguing matchup again. Carolina-Virginia is 4 Eastern Saturday on ESPN. We talked about it earlier. Nova at UConn, 8 Eastern Fox. It's also your rare situation where ESPN Game Day is going to a site where it does not have the game. That is a Fox game. Game Day will emanate there from earlier in the day in Gamble. First time it's been there, I think they said since like 2010, because ESPN doesn't have big rights, TV rights anymore, and so that's why they never go to Big East games. Um, Butler at Seton Hall, speaking of the Big East, 8.30 Eastern. This is an FS2 special double bubble game. Butler, Seton Hall. Um Winner is definitely uh, definitely in the field. A loser might well be out in the moment, but we'll see. And then Utah at Colorado, 9 Eastern, Pac-12 Network. Parrish will not be watching it. Uh, I will get to watch it because I will be in HQ Studios, so I will get to see that game. Also a double bubble situation for the Utes and Buffaloes. Um, that's an intriguing one. So that is your Saturday What to Know. Sunday, our game we're going to pick is on Saturday. Sunday, the only game of, of note that we didn't really get into that I think is pretty, uh, pretty urgent is FAU at Memphis. The Owls got a win that over SMU on uh, on Thursday night. That was impressive. Elijah Martin had one of the best dunks I've seen the entire season. Paris was on a flight. He didn't see when it happened, but it was ridiculous. Uh, so FAU at Memphis, uh, that's his ESPN tip at two Eastern on Sunday. We'll uh, no matter the winner or loser there, we'll definitely mention that one on our on our Sunday show. SMU also plays out South Florida. That's another good game in the American at noon Eastern. There's some other ones, but they aren't as urgent. The and one, mm -hmm. I haven't said it yet. People deducing, you know what it is. Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's Texas at Kansas on ESPN on Jeff Withy Court. This is Kansas minus six, Parrish. And the number from Ken Palm there, again, FanDuel line is not out yet. That is actually smaller than I would anticipate it. I am Gotta believe that when that line comes out, it's going to be Kansas by more than six points. But here, we get it at six, and I will not adjust. I will keep it at six. Who you got? Horns he's, down. Yeah, he's doing. If you're waiting for him to talk, he was doing horns down with his arthritic hands. Horns down. Horns down. You can't spend half the season complaining about horns down and then go win at Allen Fieldhouse. I think I feel like that's a law. That's almost what you have to do if you're going to complain about horns down is you better, you better win at Allen Fieldhouse. Yeah, I don't think that's the way this usually goes. I don't think that's how this goes. We're laying six points. Six points from Ken Palm, by the way. Hey, listen, we're up against it, but real quick. Uh, speaking of Ken Palm, speaking of Bill Self, I talked to Bill Self earlier this week because I wrote a column for the court report. A Hall of Fame has contributors. It's got 76 of them. And so I uh, I believe I was the first person to put this out there. And it might take it might take a while. Ken Pomeroy should be a contributor to the Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame. Agree or disagree? Uh, agree. Of yeah. course. He's incredibly important to the, the sport. Like, like one of the most important people to the sport. I mean that genuinely. Yes, without a doubt. And 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 across all of it. Um yeah, his information is more referenced than than anyone. So yeah, I talked to Billis, I talked to Bill Self. Sean Miller, uh, I didn't realize this, uh, but Sean Miller was the first coach to kind of publicly back in 2005 uh, endorse Ken Palm. Oh, young listeners, Paris doesn't remember this, but I very much do. Back in the back in the old days, when uh, when Paris was a once a week guest on this podcast, he used to destroy Ken Palm. And then I don't know what changed for you. I don't think that's that's true. that doesn't feel like it's it true at all. Listen to me, it absolutely happened. Okay. I think I, I think I was pushing back on you nerds a little bit. Yeah, no, you loved pushing back on Ken Palm. And then like somewhere around like 2013, 14, you saw the light. So I'm I appreciate nerd. it. I, I went from I went from picking on nerds to I just became one. <laughs> and then, you know what? Welcome to the club. There ain't nothing wrong with that. Uh self, obviously. I, I got an active Hall of Famer to say that he should and self very much agreed. Um self, uh, we also got into talking a little bit about his rotations and all that stuff and Rotation. He don't have no rotation. Exactly. Well, just talking about talking about that that situation. So, you know, he, he's like he has a starting lineup, and then he just goes, and then he sits down. Well, I I know he's. Uh, have you looked at him? The, every one of them dudes plays thirty four minutes now. All of them. The, the, yeah, the, I, I'm. A, we talked about that very thing. In fact, um, I I know it's it's wild. So it's why like Texas might have a shot here. I just. 
you know what? What the hell? Yeah. I'm going to regret this. Whatever. I'll take Texas to cover. No shot in hell am I taking Texas to win in Fog Allen. Not happening. If it's six, I'll I'll pick them inside the line. I got to get back to a side mount situation anyway, GP. So you'll take the Jayhawks and I'll take the Longhorns. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry M.F. and Teagle. Legend. Shouts to Huck Larnell. Thank you guys once again for watching, listening to the Ion College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple and Spotify. There's more of us than there are of them. That should be reflected in the comments. So do that. We'll talk to you again on Sunday. Till then, take care.